I'd like to welcome Raleigh and Bridget to the Bible study. It's every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, and every Sunday we have a 1 o'clock service right in here. It seems like the world has been very chaotic lately, but there's a Bible verse that I think we all need to remember and read each day. And it comes um, from Second uh, Corinthians 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. There's been a lot of, today in the news, there's been a lot of uh, shootings at a medical facility and other shootings in the la over the past year. And if we, this country really needs to turn back to God. Okay. Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll get started with the Bible study. Father God, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for this day. Lord, we do know there's so much stuff going on in this country and around the world. So much tension, so much strife, so much evil that people just don't recognize it. And they just think it's a common everyday occurrence. But Lord God, there's, there's something wrong with people's hearts that they, they think shooting people is the answer. Going back to the man in Texas on Friday, he shot kill five people because they told him to stop shooting in his front yard. Uh, Lord, you know, that's, that's crazy. And Lord, I, I'm glad they got him. I, I hope they meet a right justice to him. But all these people are doing this, it seems like that's their first response if somebody doesn't do what they want. But we raised up a generation, or two generations of people who, who were told they were special None of us are special except the one, the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the only perfect person who ever lived. He is the only one who's special. The rest of us are his creatures, but each one of us, anything special about us comes through the shed blood of Christ. Nothing we do. But there's so many people that if they don't get their way, they're, they're ready to do violence. And that that's just not what we're, we should be doing. And Lord God, we just pray for all the ones who've been injured. Pray for the families who've lost loved ones. We pray for the family of that young woman who had just got married and another lady ran into the back of the golf cart, killed her outright, and injured the other three in the golf cart. Lord, we pray for all of them. We pray for the woman because her life is over. And Lord, we just pray for the families. Lord, we thank you for your blessings. We do pray for all the students of blessing. We lift them up to you, Lord, for you to help them with all the tests, far and range, whatever they have, Lord, we lift them up to you, to your, your, your hand of guidance and direction. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Okay, turn in your Bibles to the book of Nahum, chapter 3. Of course, now we don't have the scripture up here on the board, too, on the slides. This is the last chapter of Nahum, and seeing as nobody that's in here tonight was here for the first two chapters and never heard me say that Nahum is the, he's the anti-Jonah. Jonah wanted to go to Nineveh and preach. God's going to destroy you. There's nothing you can do. Well, Jonah went and took God's word and went and preached it to Nineveh. And Nineveh repented. And they had a 120-year period from the time of Jonah's ministry to, to Nahum, where they, they had been redeemed because they repented. But... Nahum, on the other hand, he's a prophet to, to Nineveh also. But he's not coming and saying, hey, look, if you guys repent one more time, God will, will spare you. No, he's coming and tells us, look, you guys, your time is up. You messed up. You had a chance, but you fell back in your ways. There is no room for repentance. There's no room for forgiveness of sin. There's no room for anything except your destruction. And I'll read this one note out, out of my Bible. It said, Nineveh had been given the privilege of knowing the one true God. Under Jonah's preaching, this great Gentile city had repented, and God had graciously stayed his judgment. However, a hundred years later, Nahum proclaims the downfall of this same city. The Assyrians had, have forgotten their revival, have returned to their habits of violence, adultery, and arrogance. As a result, Babylon will so destroy the city that no trace of it remains, a prophecy fulfilled in painful detail. Now, let me, let me explain what God's doing here. Nahum is one of the minor prophets, and he's, he's one of the two, Jonah being the other one, who spoke to somebody besides Israel or Judah about their impending destruction. But what God did was when the northern kingdom of Israel messed up for them to idolatry and child sacrifice, you know, anything that was against God, he used Assyria to come in and take them out in captivity. That was their punishment. But God is a righteous God, and even though he ordains it, he, he put it in motion, for them to be taken out into captivity for punishment. There she is. Amen. They, they were not going to get on scot free. So that's what it's talking about. Babylon came in and conquered the Assyrians and destroyed Nineveh. And that's what's, where we're at. And that's what's going on. And this is the last chapter. But it says in chapter 3, verse 1 Woe to the bloody city. It is full of lies, robbery, its victims, and never departs. Well, what he's talking about is, is the bloody city is Nineveh, as we said. And he said, but it was known throughout the Middle East as a city that excelled in violence and bloodshed. And that was why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh and preach to them, because they were so wicked, so bloody. They, they did things that were horrific to people. I mean, they... Uh, I guess if they had had it, then they'd have played soccer in people's heads or something. But I mean, they were just a, a despicable people, but they repented. And they repented because, and I think God allowed them to repent so he could use them later on because God being omniscient <laughs> knew what was going to happen and he knew he was going to need the Assyrians to go in and bring the, the Israelites out of the northern kingdom into exile. So he knew that. So he gave them a, a space, a breathing space to repent. And knowing they were going to go back to the royal ways, he had Nahum waiting on the wings to go preach their destruction to them. The verse 2 says, The noise of a whip and the noise of rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of clattering chariots. All these things a picture are, are, the, are the power of the military machine of the Assyrians. And it's... Uh, Horses and chariots and instruments of war. And verse 3 will describe the chariots were instruments of war. I mean, 
They birthed street scribes, the horrors of the nation's war machine, which resulted in countless corpses. So that's what it says when it says the victims never left. I'm gonna read it. Okay, that's, that's what Sean was going to answer. The first three says, horsemen charge with bright sword and glittering spear. There is a multitude of slain, a great number of bodies, countless corpses. They stumble over the corpses. And that was another thing the Assyrians liked to do. They didn't clean up the battlefield. They just left them to, to their own devices. If you were dead, and you couldn't bury yourself and get yourself out and just stay there. And that's that's what a picture what the picture they're showing is. Verse four says, because of the multitude of harlotries of the seductive harlot, the mistress of sorcerers, who sells nations through her harlotries and families through their her sorcerers. Now when it talks about harlotries in here, it's talk about idol worship. Because Assyria, as I read a minute ago, Assyria had the perfect, perfect interaction with God. When Jonah came and preached repentance to them, that if they didn't repent in 40 days, that God was going to destroy their, their land. And over that 100-year period, they had a chance to know the one true living God. But they ended up rejecting it, going back into the idolatry and everything else. You know, uh, people tell me, uh, ask me sometimes, says, why was God so mean to the people who were in the land, around the land, when the Israelites came back into, into the promised land? Why was he so mean to them? Why did he tell them to kill everybody? Because for 400 years, he worked with the people, and they still fell into idolatry, and they stayed in idolatry. You know, the might and power he showed and the things he did in creation, that didn't matter to them. They just stayed the same wicked idolatry as they were. So God was really true. He was trying to purify the land. But he knew He knew even his people, God's people, Saul, David, Solomon, they would never clear all the people out. Saul, he, he saved, killed most and kept some, and let some live, and that caused problems. Then we had uh, David. He never conquered everything that was Israel. And Solomon said, what do you have, 700 wives, three, 300 concubines? What an idiot. He was wise. He made it a wise man in the world, but he was an idiot. I just, anybody to set yourself up for that kind of heart run. And, you know, I, and this was, I said it as a joke, and I don't, I don't remember it from last Sunday. And I said, that, you know, some people were trying to say that Jesus was married. I said, if he'd have been married, he, he wouldn't have been a suitable sacrifice on the cross because he would have sinned. <laughs> <laughs> so we know he wasn't married. <laughs> but uh, that's just my personal ob observation. <laughs> Now, not to, not to Miss Terry makes me sin. Right? This is my wife, I'll break very good. She didn't tell you. I think she did tell you. But uh, she, she's never made me sin. The devil did it. The devil did it. Well, I told you what horrors were. That was the idolaters. And you know, we know the sorceries. Um, somebody come up, they got a class on reading tarot cards, you know, that, that, that's, you know, I, I can't even come up with anything good to say about tarot cards. You know, people say, well, it's just a game. It's like, Ouija board, that's just a game. But anything you do like that can open the door for Satan to come in, especially when believers do. Verse 5 says, Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. 
I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. You know, uh, there was another place in Scripture, I meant to look it up from my notes and stuff, about putting, pulling their skirt up over their face, showing their nakedness. But it's the same people that we're talking about. But they, they just, it's just a whole thing to shame, shame them. And he's doing everything through Nahum that he can to inflame these people, to let them know that with all your power, all your military might, all the things you have, it's not going to be enough because you're not, you're not fighting against flesh and blood. You're fighting against God, and God is going to defeat you. And it says, it says I'm against you. This repetition of this phrase from 2.13 is more chilling each time it's heard. Who could survive the Lord's opposition? Lift your skirts. The, Lord's, the Lord would publicly humiliate Nineveh. And that was, it. that was his goal because they had completely humiliated the northern kingdom of Israel. And Israel, they got what they deserved. I'll put it this way. They got what they deserved because they had fallen away from God. They were not doing what they were supposed to be doing in worship. They were not living the life they were supposed to live. They would take and they would uh, sacrifice to Jehovah God over here, but then they would go sacrifice to Baal over the other side. You know, they would try to have it both ways. And I talked to a young man here a while ago. I invited him to come to worship service or to Bible study. And he said, well, I'm not into religion. I said, well, I'm not into religion either, but I, it's about a relationship, not a, not a religion. They were involved in religion. They were involved in temple religion. They were involved, involved in idolatry religion, but they weren't involved with a relationship with God. And that's what God calls for. That's what he, the whole, this whole thing out here spinning off in the universe is about is us having a relationship with the one true living God. And it's so many times we just don't get that. Verse 6, Miss Terry. Verse 6. Thank you. I have to let these people know she's out there somewhere. <laughs> she, she don't like to come up here and read your stuff at the beginning. But I'm just standing here. And I just tell them to throw my voice. Well, at least she's more relaxed. <laughs> Verse 6 says, I will cast abominable filth upon you, make you vile, and make you a spectacle. So the Lord described the fate of Nineveh as comparable to a person on whom unspeakable filth was cast when Nineveh lay in ruins and no one would boom on her. The nations would be glad that the city was gone. And that's true. That, that is, is true because it says in 7, it shall come to pass that all who look upon you will flee from you and say, none of it is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? Where shall I seek comforters for, for you? So in those two verses, it's basically telling us that you go, God's going to destroy you, but you know what? Nobody cares. Nobody's going to care because they had no friends anywhere in their territory. They had no friends to come in and help them. And we're going to look at that in a second. But how how terrible should these guys feel that God that God that saved them, that let them, that spared them for a hundred years, that now he there's no sparing involved. There's nothing but retribution. I, I kept looking at it because I, I, I was hoping I could find some comforters for, for Nineveh, for Assyria, but I can't find any either. It says in verse 8, Are you better than no Ammon? That was situated by the river that had the waters around her, whose rampart was the sea, whose wall was the sea. So it says no Ammon 
The river says the destruction of the city of Thebes near the Nile River in 663 BC was going to be a template for the destruction of Nineveh. No Amen is the Hebrew name for Thebes. Thebes. Derived from the Egyptian name meaning city of the God, little g God. Amen, the little, uh, little g God named Amen. The argument seems to suggest that before its destruction, no one would have even dreamed of the fall of Thebes. But the destruction had happened. Not long before the writing of the book of Nahum, the city of Thebes was rebuilt only to be destroyed later during the Roman period. Nineveh, however, would never be rebuilt. So, God's taken one place that he just destroyed out of, uh, I don't call it retribution, I call it out of, out of his justice. You know, that's something that we, we need to be, be careful of. We always scream for justice, but what we really want is grace. Because, if we got justice, then we would be in the same boat as none of the Assyrians are. But it's grace we want. It's the undeserved mercy of God. That's what we're really crying out for. Because too many people will take and think they can get over on God, which, you know, even David said, you, you can't hide from God. You can't go in deep enough, you can't go high enough, you can't go far afield enough that he's not, not always there. In fact, God tells us, tell the story that there was a period of time when I wasn't walking with God as I should. I was kind of going away from him and running off in a different direction. Wasn't doing anything bad, just wasn't paying attention to God. Then the Holy Spirit got a hold of me and I said, you know what, I need to turn around and run back in the other direction. I turn around and Terry likes that. Bam, he was right there. He said, man, I've been here the whole time with you. That uh, I never let you go, because I knew you were going to turn back. But we, we, we often feel like we've done such bad things that God would never, but he's always right there waiting on you to repent. You know, uh, we repent when we're, we're saved we shouldn't, be, shouldn't have to keep repenting, but we should be convicted of our sin. When we, once we're saved, we sin, the Holy Spirit convicts us that, hey, you know what, that was wrong. You, you need to confess that. You confess it to Jesus Christ, and he, he's faithful to forgive you. You know, I, when I was studying this, the no aiming, I knew there was a guy named Amen in the Bible, but I didn't know his first name was No. But that, that was a place, like I said, like I read in my notes, it was Thebes. But when we go through some of these some of these names, Miss Terry and I, she, she gets me to pronounce everything. That's a good practice. <laughs> but if if I get it wrong, well, she, most times she she doesn't know either. But she does get me sometimes. <laughs> All right, when we do the the, the uh, come on now, help help me out here. The genealogies and stuff. Oh, your <laughs> you know, those, those I, I tell you, you need to read other things that's in the Bible, but you need to get past those genealogies. You can yeah. skip over them really fast if you want to. <laughs> But as I told her also, as you get read down through genealogy, and all of a sudden there's an event that happened in the middle. Mm -hmm. Somebody in that genealogy did something. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't read all of it, then you missed that. Mm -hmm. When you took the trivia, the Bible trivia test on YouTube, then you wouldn't have got the answer right. <laughs> Verse 9 says, Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength, and it was boundless. Put and Lubin were your helpers, yet she was carried away. She went into captivity. Her young children also were dashed to pieces at the head of every street, 
they cast lots for her honorable men, and all her great men were bound in chains. Ooh, that's, that's some, that's some hard, hard sounding stuff going on there. And when you look at it, you know, put is not set something over that put, that's, that's the name. But it says the city of No Amen had many powerful allies, but they were not sufficient to protect her in her hour of need. Who would they, who would ally with Nineveh to fight off the Lord's attack? Now think about all the people, the different countries, the peoples, the nations, the cities that Nineveh inflicted herself on. They're not going to come back and say, yeah, yeah. We remember what you did, that you impaled babies on spears and you chopped people's heads off and you did all these manner of wicked things. We'll be right there. Just wait on us. The check is in the mail. We're coming. And then, you know, you go sit down and eat a lamb or something. But God, God is telling to Nahum that you're on your own. You're going to stand against me, and you're going to deal with this just just as uh, as uh, Noaman did. But God is God is pretty thorough when He does it Himself. If He sends people to do something, and they they haphazardly do it. Like your kid when you tell him to cut the grass and you go out there to cut the grass and there's patches of grass sticking up everywhere. Of course, I do that myself sometimes too. But uh, that's because I'm in my second childhood sometimes. <laughs> but he's, he's letting them know that, that there's no help coming. You've got no way to stand against them. And it's going to take, I believe, if, if I'm not, if I remember rightly, it took about two years of a siege for them to finally be wiped out. But it's not because God was slow in acting. It was because he was using Babylon to conquer Assyria. Verse 11 says, You also will be drunk. You will be hidden. You also will seek refuge from the enemy. So it says, drunk and hidden and seek refuge. He says, none would be the be like a helpless drunk hoping for a refuge, but finding nowhere to turn for it. I guess I'd be like Otis in, on uh, Danny Griffith's show. When he could, got drunk, he, he went to jail because that was where he got his refuge from. But the Ninevites were not going to be able to go to jail. They were not going to be able to hide out somewhere. They were going to have to do do what had to be done. Verse 12 said, All your strongholds are fig trees with ripened figs. If they are shaken, they fall into the mouth of the eater. Now, Nahum, all three chapters, he doesn't give a good thing for questions. I can ask you, uh, what, what is verse 12 saying? All your strongholds are fig trees with ripened figs. If they're shaken, they fall into the mouth of the eater. What? Can you think of what what he's saying? Making me hungry. Yeah, well. <laughs> the lady next to us has got two fig trees, and I see the squirrels running up down my fence with them, dropping them on the ground. <laughs> but. They say, because he said a stronghold, so at that time, the strongholds was about, it was everything, because it was but based upon this um, scripture, even though their strongholds are like fig trees with ripe fruit, it's no, they can't stand against God. He just shake them down. Mm -hmm. yeah. Shake them down. It's nothing. A stronghold is nothing against my power. That is yeah, exactly right. But you, you, you're right. It does make you hungry for figs. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. Once you shake those fig trees, they fall. Yeah. Well, she cut something else back there. This is not part of Bible study. I picked one the other day because it was hanging over my side of the fence. I don't know what it was, but it was bitter, so I, I let her have it back. Sandy, so, if you see this tonight, don't, 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 don't. 
Actually, it's pretty bitter because the squirrels who don't leave anything anywhere, they're still leaving them hanging there. The couple squirrels we got, they ate, ate a little bit off of a couple of them, left them hanging. The ones that have grown out, they haven't gone back to eat, so maybe it's too bitter for the squirrel. Verse 13 says, Surely your people in the midst are women. The gates of your land are wide open for your enemies. Fire shall devour the bars of your gates. 13, I mean, that, that, not today. We won't say that's an insult today. But to the Ninevites, that was a definite insult. Said, your people in your midst are women. What he's talking about is, I don't even want to go there. <laughs> I don't want to go there. <laughs> what, what he's doing is he's, he's putting them down by calling them women. And that's some pretty rough women out there today. So I, I don't know if I would still apply today as he did before. But said, the gates of your land are are wide open for your enemies. Fire shall devour your bars and your gates. You know, God's to, to Nahum is telling him, says, all your defenses, you know, you can have a walled city, but if your gates are open, you might as well not have any walls. Just like when uh, the Medo-Persians conquered Babylon a few, few years later, they diverted the river that was going underneath the wall, the wall city of Babylon, and they marched under there. So, I mean, if you've got any any gaping hole in your, your wall where people can come and conquer you, then it's not much of a wall. Verse 14 is, uh, draw your water for the siege. Fortify your strongholds. Go into the go into the clay and shred the mortar. Make strong the brick kiln. And fifteen goes on and says, There are, there the fire will devour you, the sword will cut uh, cut you off, and I will eat up I will eat you up like a locust. Make yourself many like the locust. Make yourself many like the swarming locust. So what he's telling them in verse 14, just draw your water for the siege and get ready and fortify your strongholds. Go into the, go into the clay and shred the mortar and make a strong. Well, he's telling them, he's telling them, do all this stuff. Get all this stuff ready. Get everything perfectly like you want it. Have your men, your chariots, have everything lined up, and it's not going to be enough. No matter what you do, it's not going to be enough to stand against the one true living God. And then going back to 15, he said, there the fire will devour you. So it's talking about make the, the brick, brick kiln hot, make it big, make it hot. And just as with Daniel, three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that they made the, the furnace seven times hotter and it killed the ones that threw them in the fire. But that's what he's talking about. Like it says, Nahum taunted Nineveh by telling the people to prepare for their siege. The actual siege of Nineveh continued for over two years. I knew I had it. For two years. But if you think about it, we said that it took two years for Babylon to conquer them. But think about it this way. God could have did just like he did to Sodom and Gomorrah, just just destroyed it and not worried with it. But how many Sodom and, Sodoms and Gomorrah do we need to destroy before people get the get the point? But when you have a, a this, they had had been the baddest people on the block for a good while, and they're they're under siege, doing things, having things done to them that they were doing to everybody else. How much more of a picture of what disobedience of God will picture. And these people, they, they had no uh, recourse except to, 
to go and do the best they could, but they were still standing against God, and it was happening on God's timetable. And it said, when it says, make yourselves like like the locusts, like the locusts, make yourself many, like the swarming locusts. And it really, truly, it wouldn't matter how many they had, they were still going to be, be, be conquered or taken into captivity. Verse 16 says, you have multiplied your merchants more than the stars of heaven. The locust plunders and flies away. So 16 and 17 together says, um, 17 says, your commanders are like swarming locusts and your generals like great grasshoppers which camp in the hedges on a cold day. When the sun rises, they flew, flee, away, flee away in the place where they are not known, in the place, in the place where they are not known. So it's saying, despite the great economic and military strength of Nineveh, there was nothing lasting in the day in the city's power. When the sun rises, the people of Nineveh would be like nocturnal insects that, that disappear at daylight. So he's saying that as long as, as, long as it's uh, dark, they're out doing whatever they can do. But when the sun comes up, you know, I, I put it as they don't want to be a target. But again, it says in the notes, the people of Nineveh would be like nocturnal insects that disappear in the daytime. Now that's like, uh, well, I haven't seen it in a long time, but around here, you can get these palmetto bugs. Everybody, everybody familiar with palmetto bugs? I haven't seen it, but I've heard of it. Huh? I haven't seen it. Well, I've, I've been places where when they scurry around, uh, well, after my dad passed away, I was helping clean up some stuff. And there's been a piece of plywood laid down on some oak leaves. And I said, well, I can get that out of here and clean it. Well, they, I don't know how many it was. It was hard to tell because so many of them looked like oak leaves. But, I mean, they were scattered. They were, they were wet, and it was just like, I said, we can't have this around here. But you can go, I guarantee you, you can ride around Charleston and places, and you can find people who's got them. But when they come in, they, they go like this, they turn the light on so they don't seem to scurry away. Because if you don't seem to scurry away, then you don't know you have to kill them. Let's go to, go to 18, Mr. It says, your shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. Your nobles rest in the dust. Your people are scattered on the mountains. No one gathers them. Your injury has no healing. Your wound is severe. All, you, all who hear news of you will clap their hands over you. For upon whom has not your wickedness past continue. So verse 19 is, is especially telling, I think, because it says, your injury has no healing, your wound is severe. All who hear news of you will clap their hands over you. For upon whom has not your wickedness passed? They've been bad to everybody. They've not had anybody that they've had a redeeming relationship with they just dealt with everybody in, in their strength and they didn't realize that the strength that they were operating out of was the strength that God allowed them to have because he used them as an instrument of discipline for his people, his called out people. He used them for that. That's why they had so much, so much power, so much of everything was to be able to do that, but it was going to show again the power of God, but he's going to take all that away from him. And that, that was the problem he had with the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Jebusites, all, all the ites, is he showed them his power and strength and his grace, 
and they rejected it. That's why he used the Israelites coming back in to destroy Jericho, eventually Ai, and all the other places. It's because these places were populated by people who had rejected the one true living God, and that can't go on forever. And there's coming a day that people who reject the Lord Jesus Christ, they're going to be called to account because they've had an opportunity. The things have been given to them. They don't have an excuse. That's when people say, well, how can God consign somebody to hell? God doesn't consign anybody to hell. It's a choice. It's a personal choice we make to believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior or to de deny him. And if we deny him, our fate's already set. You know, there's a staircase at the Cove, the Billy Graham uh, Training Center. It's got, actually, if you look at it, it's got three sets of stairs. One, you go up and you go to the right, one, you go to the left. But the one in the middle, it doesn't go anywhere. It's got a, uh, a banister there that bars. It just goes to that, and it's, I guess they didn't want to make real wide stairs wider than they did, so they put that to fill the space in. But that's that's what you get a picture of. People try to go down the middle and say, I'll jump over to this side, but there is no middle. You're either with Jesus or you're not. Nahum had a I think an unenviable job. He didn't he didn't preach to the Israelites or the Judeans about their destruction, they're coming into captivity. He didn't preach about any of that. He had to preach to people, tell them, your time is up. Everything that you've done is called to account. But we, we, again, we need to always use, keep in perspective that God empowered them to do what they did. He didn't, he didn't say, be wicked and do all the things you did. He didn't do that with Babylon either, but he still empowered those people to do the things that they needed to do. And, well, we go there either. But God uses the, the evil ones to get his will done. He'll use whatever it takes for his will to be fulfilled. Question? Yes. Any questions? How did they city enough to make it a big city? Yeah. I want to give a big city. Okay. Allow me. We'll hear that. Well, we're just, we're, we're, that was the last verse. So if you got a Thanksgiving, that would be good. So I just want to say thank you to God and for bringing me here and making me stronger in areas that I did not know I needed strength in. Um, and I'm thankful and grateful for you guys being here, and I'm thankful to God for just being here mm -hmm. with me and having this hour to dedicate to him and you guys being our sh the structure. I'm so grateful for that. Mm -hmm. And um, thankful to Riley for giving me tips on Sunday. I passed my test. So I've actually passed all my tests with flying colors this week. <laughs> Very <laughs> good. So I'm good. super grateful, and I just wanted to say well, we appreciate that. We're thank glad you, that you did. Thank you guys, thank you to God for bringing you guys here and you guys being like super obedient. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, sometimes when you're at 4 o'clock in the afternoon when you get nothing ready to come out here, you say, well, you know, I hope somebody comes. I hope somebody shows up. So we're going to show up. But you know what? God always seems like he provides. So we don't, we don't sit in and preach to an empty room very often. And, uh, any questions? Uh, I can I can give y'all a test if y'all want a test. Yes, we'll take it. <laughs> I passed them all with white colors apparently, so I'm ready for another one. Well, I'm proud of you. Yeah, I am too. I think that's great. Thank you. But we've been praying for you, for all of you. You know, uh, Miss Tara, what did you say? So make up a test. Make up or make up some questions when you do Bob some you do in her home. So then I made up questions. And it was like a test. It wasn't just, and then she told me, says, well, you met that stuff too hard. I, I said, okay. Like, oh, I found this. I love this thing. My plan. 
This, this is what I'm going to do. This was my plan when I went to seminary. That's where I'm at. And I, and I was, you know, I was going to go get a church, and I was going to serve God in the local church. But God's plan was, when I went to the local church, we, we, we didn't agree. So th these are the things he brought me to, but he's still going to get me to the to the end. Now, I'm going to have to adjust this slide the next time I do it, because the finish, finish um, slide is over there. But it's hard to sit at home and make these slides out and do everything with them and then count them being right on this television. Mm -hmm. Of course, I could go fix it now, but <laughs> we won't. Any other questions? <laughs> anyway, let me read it. I didn't read it. This tells a little, I just had a thump in the foot because I didn't actually read it. Sometimes God doesn't do things the way we think he should, but God has a perfect plan for your life. Trust God. Amen. Amen. I don't think I can hardly come up with a better closing prayer. Well, I, I like your illustration where your plan is just straight through, straight through, no problems. But I like your illustration because each one shows a different type of, of how I like to say, a storm. It, the, the first one is that water. You're going through some waters. Going there. through deep waters. Deep waters, and then you got some rocky stuff you're dealing with. Spice. I love you. And then the spice, and oh my gosh, those storms. Woo! Those storms. Is, oh. So it's like um, I, I've heard other uh, pastors and preachers say you, it's that hateful middle. And Joyce Myers referred to that too. She said, Yeah, you can get to the end. God has an end for you. You just gotta give you that middle. That yeah, middle. You've you got to take you've got to do the journey. You, you yeah. Can't. And uh you know, <laughs> I, I, look, I look at this this is the narrow way. Because when when Jesus said said I'm you know, take the narrow narrow path, mm -hmm. not the wide path. Well the wide path when you when you stand right before you go in, you got this really beautiful uh, pastoral scene with wildflowers that were. When you step over, it's a lot different. But when you know the narrow path, which this, this to me represents the narrow path more than anything else, even though you're on the path and you're going, you still have to go through all these things. And, uh, and I said a while ago that I don't think we need to say, well, every time we sin, we're repenting, because repenting means change of attitude, change of direction. Well, if, if we keep repenting, then do we ever really repent? It's the, the difference is you repent of your sin with the knowledge that, but you know, I'm gonna still sin anyway because we all we all have that sin nature. So when we sin and you're walking off and you say something, think something, even if you think something, you say, oh, you know, Lord Jesus, forgive me for that. And you know, that's what we, we need to do to restore a relationship or fellowship with Christ is to stay confessed up. But being conf uh, having unconfessed sin in the believer doesn't affect your salvation. It just affects your walk with Christ. Because if you're, if you're out of that right relationship with him, then nothing's going to go right. Then you're going to be like this. You'll be falling in all these holes and stuff. But he's faithful to set you know, as, as we come through him, we fall in, he's faithful to pull us up out of the water and put us back on dry land again as we go down. We fall in the rocky crags, he's, he's faithful to pick us back up and put us on the thing. We just have to confess. And it's, I don't know, it just, I don't understand how people can sit and say, well, I, I, I don't care, I'm not interested, I don't believe. Um, well, you know, uh, when we discussed it here, I think it was Sunday, about just going, just saying, Jesus, for the last person, the person who's thinking I come to, to say, Jesus, forgive my sin. Then, you, But you have to back up. You have to ask, who is this Jesus you're talking to? Are you talking to the virgin born? Oh, I didn't believe in that virgin born stuff. Not me. He lived, oh, he must have done something wrong. Well, he went to the, well, yeah, I don't, so 
who are you if you don't believe he's virgin born, lived a sinless life, went to the cross, bled and died, was raised on the third day? If you don't believe all that, who, what Jesus are you asking to forgive your sin? Amen. I know. Hey, I just threw my wife a kiss. <laughs> You can turn us off now. <laughs> Look, 